forget what you've done save me forever by your holy one place all my shortcomings onto your son now i'm made righteous i'm pure on your side all my history falls to the side it's not once it's not twice it's for Church, can we stand to our feet as we praise the Lord of our lives? Turn to your neighbor and say, Jesus is my Lord. Bye. 
that we worship you and we praise you not only for what you've done, but for who you are. We worship you, holy God, so holy.
A song to sing on a Sunday morning. Hallelujah, our God reigns. What a song to sing in our nation right now. Hallelujah, our God reigns. What a song to sing in that place of brokenness that you might find yourself in this morning. Hallelujah, God reigns. Friends, this morning I really just felt this as we're singing this song. That fear was leaving this place. I really just felt as we're lifting up these truths that God reigns, that anyone in this place who was struggling with fear, uncertainty, worry, that God is bringing healing right now. Isaiah 43 says, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob. He who created you, Matthew, Jill, Mike, Sarah. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you pass through the waters, will you pass through waters? You will, why? I will be with you. And through the rivers, they no, shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Your Savior. Who's Savior? my Savior. Holy Spirit, we just invite you in this place. fear in this place. He reigns. May that be our anthem. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah.
seats. For those of you who are feeling a bit shortchanged in just our singing expression of worship, don't worry, I'm gonna ask the, the band to come back up at the end of my message and we're gonna, we're gonna have another song and just worship Jesus. But I, I felt to just jump in because Mark and I hadn't spoken around what was burning on my heart this morning in terms of what I believe the Lord is wanting to minister to us today. And it is everything to do with God's truth replacing fear in our lives. Isn't that amazing? And so I didn't wanna let this, this moment go. And I believe God is wanting to do a work in our hearts as we open up our hearts to Him this morning. But uh, I believe there's gonna be great liberty for, for people here, for people listening, for people whose hearts are perhaps in a place of just feeling weighed down and burdened. So I'm gonna ask that we just open up in a time of honoring this, this moment and placing the person of honor in our focus. So Father God, I thank you that you are present with us right now. Thank you, Father God, that your word says it is your goodness that draws us to a place of repentance. And that because of you, Lord Jesus, all our repentance is, it is a response to the work that you have already achieved. And thank you, Lord Jesus, that, that when you left this planet in a physical form, that you didn't leave us as orphans, you didn't leave us alone, but you sent the great helper, the great comforter, the great guide, the great counselor, you, Holy Spirit, and thank you, Holy Spirit, that we can acknowledge your presence with us right now. Thank you that you're moving, that you're moving. Friends, can I ask that, that you just open your hands, just where you're sitting, just open your hands and keep your eyes closed for a moment and just become aware of the presence of God. Become aware of the presence of God. Oh, Holy Spirit, right now you can do in a moment in a moment, what therapy couldn't do in a year. You can do in a moment, Holy Spirit, what not all the medicine in the world can do. You can do in a moment, Lord God, what many years of pain yeah. and trauma have built up. You can release that and bring liberty and freedom. So right now we ask for more yeah. of your presence, your tangible presence in our lives, more of your tangible presence in our church. Oh, in our city, in our nation. You are our hope, Lord Jesus. You are our hope. Oh, and we worship you this morning. We turn our attention and affection toward you this morning. I want to ask that, that you just keep your eyes closed for, for a little while longer. Friends, we got out of our room for the Holy Spirit just to interrupt our plans. Mark was, was reading a text and he spoke around the instruction to fear not, I will call you by name for I am your savior. It was interesting this morning as I was just waiting on the Lord, I, I felt that there were five specific names that the Lord wanted me to read out. So it's just again, the Holy Spirit leading. Alex, and Sia, Nyembo, Carter, Samantha. I feel like there are specific names that Jesus is saying, I see you, I know your story, and I'm your savior. And Lord God, for every other person who didn't have their name read out, thank you that you're as real, that you're as concerned with them, you're as focused on their lives as the people that you've identified. Oh, we love you, our God. Amen. Amen. A warmer welcome to you on this uh, summer in July Sunday. 
Uh, if you're new and you're visiting, we are busy having a, a bit of fun after our Sunday meetings with the Summer in July theme. So please hang around and, and join us. You'll hear a bit more about that after the service. But um, for those of you who haven't been around for a while, my name's Trevor, and it's my privilege just to be sharing with you this morning. Um, Ash and Nadine send their greetings. They're ministering at a church in Pretoria and uh, have been there this weekend just speaking life into people's lives. So they always miss you when they're away, but, uh, but we know that they are being used of the Lord where they are in Pretoria this morning. So Ash has a saying, and uh, he often says, love is only complete when it is expressed. Have, have any of you ever heard him say that? You people must listen, come on. Look at the person next to you and poke them, just, just see if they're awake. So love is only complete when it is expressed. And what I wanna share around this morning is I wanna share around what does expressed love look like in our context. But I wanna give us a couple of practical handles and I wanna invite you into a place of starting to, to think firstly, do I really know the love of God? Because until I really know and experience the love of God, it's gonna be very hard for me to express that to others. But then secondly, once I know the love of God, what is holding me back from expressing it to people who don't yet know Him? I can just see like all the introverts out there like, I know where this is going, Trev. <laughs> no. But I wanna encourage us that God is bringing specific people into every one of our frame of reference for a purpose to see His love expressed. Behind me is a, is a picture board and I've stolen some of these pictures from a wall in our lounge. So Abigail and I, when we first moved into our house, we didn't have anything on the walls. And the first thing that we put on the wall was, was a big four by one and a half meter frame. And we were like, we are gonna fill this with images of people that we love and care for. And so I've had to borrow a couple of these from our wall at home, but, um, it's so important that we understand the question of who is in my frame. Would you mind looking at the person next to you and saying, who's in your frame? So the thing about the, thing about the people we put up on our walls, who of you is ever gonna put a person up on your wall that you really don't like? Okay, I, I, I can see some people know, Trev, it's not on the wall, but it is on the dartboard. And it's just like, <laughs> hey? No, we, we, we're not that kind of church for, for those of you who are visiting. Um, but we, we're not gonna put a, a person's face on the wall unless there's a connection, unless there's a care, unless we, we love them. Um, over here, this, this is a picture of my daughter on our first daddy-daughter coffee date. I was, I was getting her involved into one of my passions, which is drinking good coffee. And uh, she was about three years old over there and, and that was her first baby Chino with daddy on a, on a coffee date with, with her dad. It's an incredible moment, but, but I, I love it. When I look at that, I just, I'm like, she was so cute. And now she's bigger. Um, but anyway, so, so the, the photo at the top uh, over there, that's of Abigail's brother and, and his wife and their family and they, moved to New Zealand a number of years ago. We have unfortunately not been able to, to see them for around five years, but we love them and we pray for them and we contend for the future God has for them. Um, yo, guys, can I just say I'm married up? I'm just putting it out there. That, that is a picture of, of Abigail at a coffee date that, that we went on. It was actually on her birthday. And, and there is just, something amazing about my wife. And every time I just have to pinch myself to be like, we are on this incredible journey and Jesus allowed me to reach for you. Thank you, there is a God in heaven. <laughs> this is one of my favorite little photos. This is Tyra when she's just over a year old giving her cousin a peck on his cheek. Um, my sister and her family relocated to America.
but she's my big sis. And she loved me when I was unlovable. And she contended for the future God had for me. And she continues to pray for our family and she's got an amazing husband and, and together they, they're making a life for themselves. But oh my goodness, we, we love them so much. And over here is my, my brother and his family. They live in Cape Town. He, he is one of the funniest guys you will ever meet. He just has stories for days that, that will keep you on the ground laughing. And we just have so much fun when we're together and, and we're gonna go see them in a couple of weeks and I, I can barely wait. He's just like, he's, he, he's one of my best friends. And we, we have my, my parents-in-law and sorry for all those other guys where, where your you know, common narrative is all the mother-in-law jokes. Like my mother-in-law just isn't like that. My, my mother and father-in-law are absolutely amazing. But they had to get used to me, but they're absolutely amazing. <laughs> I think if you ask them, they, have, they, they may have a different story, but oh my goodness, they have walked through some deep valleys with us and they've been there and they've supported us and they've contended for our marriage when, when our marriage wasn't in a great place. They're special. Yeah. And, and then there's this, there's this photo of a flower in downtown Denver and this church family sent Abigail and myself to Denver to support a church plant when, when it had just been planted for three months and it was a trip that changed our lives forever. We were one degree off what God had called us to, but over years that one degree would have landed us in a very different place. But because of God's incredible grace and the generosity of this leadership team, they saw something in us that we didn't yet see. And we were able to go over to Denver and God just, sure, He did something so deep in our hearts and in our marriage and in, in our family, it was amazing. So, so you can see when I talk about who's in my frame, there's emotion attached to it because there's a deep care and a love. And, and I'm sure that's the same for any of you. When you walk around your house and you see the faces of people on, on your walls and you see the places that you've been on your walls, there's something that, that carries a connection to it. Would you agree? Yeah, that's good. And so what I wanna ask us today is I wanna ask us if we can not only have our our physical frames, but if we can also start looking at a spiritual frame. Friends, look at the person next to you and say, who's in your frame? You see, there were always people who, who hadn't yet experienced liberty and healing in the frame of Jesus. And, and what I wanna do this morning is I, I wanna give us some practical handles, perhaps some encouragement, but definitely a challenge. How are we reaching out to people in a meaningful way who may not carry the same worldview as us. In other words, how do we share this glorious gospel with people who don't yet know Jesus? Yo, and I know, I know everyone's got an experience of, of that person who approached them on the street, hey? That person. And, and, and you may not have been a believer yet, or maybe you were, and you're just like, this people gives Christian, this person gives Christians a bad name. We, we've all had those awkward experiences, yeah? And, and there's something about us talking about how do we share our Christian faith with people? Because at the end of the day, Christianity is like holding up a mirror to people and exposing their self-centered nature and saying, you gotta think about things in a different way. Who likes that? Yes, I'm not doing a great job and yes, Yes, that's an ugly part that I hope no one sees and it's awkward. But, but what I wanna suggest to us today is that it's actually easier than we think. As an NCCB family, we've got a belief that people need to first belong before they believe, before they behave, before they become all that God has called them to. The starting point is not believing, the starting point is your church. I've got family visiting from out of town. You're making us look bad over here, come on. Okay, first you have to belong, thank you. And so here's the idea that, that, that I wanna posit in our thinking is that connecting is far easier than convincing. 
when we engage people around the gospel, our primary focus should be to connect with them, not to convince them. If our primary focus is to connect with them, it takes the pressure off. And so I wanna talk to you about a story. And it's one of the greatest stories I believe in the New Testament. It's a story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman. You'll find it in John 4. But I wanna give you a bit of background, a bit of context to the story. Who, who, who of you knows or has heard of, of the text John 3, 16? It's, it's probably one of the most known, whether in the church world or out of the church world, scriptures on the planet. John 3, 16, what does it say? For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. Friends, wherever there is relational value, if I look at this, at this frame, there is relational value here, but wherever there is relational value, there has to be sacrifice. And that John 3, 16 text just is the epitome of that. We get the relational value of being in eternity with God because we respond to the grace of Jesus, but there was a great sacrifice that allowed that relational value. So, so many people know John 3, 16. Fewer people know what John 17 says. Sorry, John 3, verse 17 says, the very next text. Does, does anyone, anyone here know? So, so God so loved the world that He gave His only beloved son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Then it says, and, should I read it for us over here? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Can you see how, how sometimes as Christians, we, we get the connecting and convincing mixed around? When we're trying to convince someone, it, it, it often comes across like we wanna condemn them. But if we, we focus on connecting with them, the focus is on, on them being saved, them being liberated, them being healed, them being made whole. What fewer people do is, is they, they make the connection between, between John 3, 16 and 17 and the very next chapter, which is the chapter of the Samaritan woman. Now, now for those of you who hear Samaritan, most of you probably have a, a good connotation when you hear Samaritan, because most of you probably know the story of that good Samaritan. Samaritan. It's like, hey, Samaritan and good. It's like, sure, peas and carrots, same thing, very healthy for you, good Samaritan. But what we don't understand is that in first century Israel, that was not the case. If I had to ask you to think of the person who you least like, I know we all good Christians here, so no one's gonna hate anyone, but, but least like and most judge. That person whose, whose face, if it was on your wall, would give you a tummy cramp every time you walk past them. <laughs> Yo, someone's laughing a little too loudly. Okay. <laughs> Boom, that image is right there. Okay, thanks Trev, I can't concentrate on anything else now. So imagine Jesus takes that person and makes them the hero of the Good Samaritan story. How offended would you feel? knowing what they've done to you. That is what happened with Jesus. So, so the Samaritan people group, what, what you need to understand is when King David reigned, all of the 12 tribes of, of Israel were under a single kingdom. But then what happens is they split up. There's a Northern kingdom and a Southern kingdom. Southern kingdom is, is Jerusalem and, and that's what remains of, of the Israelite people. But the Northern kingdom that were the majority of the tribes there's an invasion by the Assyrians and, and those 10 tribes, most of them get deported and they largely get wiped out. But as would happen when an ungodly conquering nation would come in, once all the men had either, either been killed or deported, the, the ladies were left vulnerable in their ter territory. And so these Assyrians committed violent atrocities on the Jewish women that were left there. And out of those violent atrocities, the Samaritans are the offspring. 
can, can you see how, how when a Jewish person would be walking down the road and, and, and there would be a Samaritan person who would just bring this flat, a flood of, of hatred and, and a sense of it being unjust and regret and trauma. Can you see that? Are you with me? So when Jesus says the good Samaritan, he is literally creating one of the greatest oxymorons in the history of Israel. And what makes this so amazing is that when Jesus acts with this, uh, interacts with this Samaritan woman, what you will see is, is that she's got a very checkered past. Whenever the Bible is specific about something, we should take a step back and say, why? So, so Jesus' disciples have gone to get food and he's wearied from his journey. He's sitting down at the well and it says it's, it's the sixth hour of the day. And, and, and what that means is it's noon. It's midday, the hottest time of the day. And here this, this lady comes, this Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Now what the text is telling us is, is in this first century Israel, the best time to go and collect water, the woman would go in the cool of the early morning or the cool of the late afternoon. Why would a woman go collect water midday, the hottest time of the day? Why? Because she was trying to avoid every single soul she could because of the shame and the guilt that she carried from her checkered past. Can you see this, friends? So, so here you've got Jesus interacting with perhaps one of the most guilt-filled and shame-filled women of one of the, the most, sure, defiled people groups. And he chooses her to have the longest personal narrative that you will find in the New Testament. I think God is saying, take a step back, sit up and listen. Are you ready to take a step back, sit up and listen? Thank you for that overwhelmingly positive response. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read quite a lengthy text from this passage of scripture, John 4, and I'm gonna break it up at a couple of points, but, but I wanna give us some practical handles on how do we allow love to be completed through the way we express it to people that don't yet know Jesus. So John 4, verse seven to 29. A woman from Samaria came to draw water Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Would you mind saying, give me a drink? For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, now, before I continue, something very important. The starting point of Jesus' interaction with this lady is he see, sees value in her. Can you see this? You wouldn't ask someone to give you something unless you intrinsically saw some level of value in them. So Jesus sees value in this lady and he says, give me a drink. She's shocked. She's just like, why, why are you even talking with me? I, I imagine at this point in time, all of her past experience with, with, with male figures in her life, which we'll hear about later, comes flooding back. But friends, like we have to hear this today. The reason Jesus asks something of us is not because he's looking to get something, but because he wants to give us a divine blessing in return. If Jesus is asking you to surrender your life to him, it's not because he wants to get your life, it's because he wants to give you a divine blessing of peace and joy and hope in return. If Jesus is asking, I believe there's some people here, you know he's been asking you for a while. He wants more of your time. He wants more of your diary to do things he's laid on your heart. If Jesus is asking you for that, he's not just wanting more of your time. He's wanting to give a divine blessing into your schedule. If Jesus is asking you for more generosity. He's not trying to get your money. He wants to release a divine blessing in your financial sphere. Are you getting this? So when Jesus asks this lady for water, he's not trying to get water from her. He's trying to open the floodgates of a divine blessing of eternal life in her life. It goes on in verse seven. 
The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. We'll have to come here to draw water again. I, I wanna encourage us, friends. Every single person on planet earth has some kind of deep thirst in the depth of their soul. And, and do you see how she starts interacting with Jesus? Very critical, very skeptical. Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us as well? You, you say you're gonna give me water? How are you gonna draw it? Wait, wait, you, what, with your hand? Is your like stretchy arm going down into the well? And like, how, how are you gonna draw it? What, like, skeptical, criticism. And yet what does Jesus do? He knows what the deep thirst of her heart is. The deep thirst of her heart. He doesn't allow her skepticism or her criticism to distract him. He's been led at this point in time by the Holy Spirit. Because friends, although Jesus was fully God, he was also fully man. And his example is supposed to inspire the way we live. So I love this. Jesus cuts through all of her excuses, all of her distractions, and he says this, verse 16, go call your husband and come here. And it's just like in that moment, everything in this lady's inner being just explodes. And she responds, I have no husband. Jesus says to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you've had five husbands and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to a woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will, the worship, will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. It's quite a lengthy text, but, but I wanna strip it away for you. This lady had five husbands and, and the man she was now living with was no longer her husband. At not one point does Jesus point out her faults. He's inviting her into a story of redemption. Friends, in, in first century Israel, even in, in the Jewish culture, you could literally divorce your wife if she cooked you bad food. Like, like ladies didn't have rights. If, if some rabbi teachers said all a man had to do was just say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you three times and that was it. If a guy saw a prettier lady walking down the road, he could just be like, yes, no, I divorce you, let's go. Like it, it was that absurd. So we don't know the context to what happened to those five husbands, but even if in the very best case scenario, like five of them died and, and she was just left by herself looking for the next husband, can you imagine the trauma that this lady must have gone through? Like this is deep. And so what does Jesus do? He, he looks at what is the fear that is keeping her captive? And I love, again, just how the Holy Spirit was moving this morning, highlighting this idea of fear. Fear will always suppress the truth of who we are and what God has called us to. And so Jesus first has to, has to reveal the fear, this fear of rejection, the fear of being alone, the fear of having no one to support her, the fear of, of no one loving her, of her not being good enough. He exposes that fear, but then he does something beautiful and by explaining what a true worshiper is, he gives her hope that she could also be a true worshiper. It's not about the place you're from. It's not about the place you worship. It's about the heart. So she responds and she says, I know that the Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Verse 26, Jesus said to her, 
I who speak to you am he. Verse 28, so the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? Friends, this Samaritan woman is the first person that Jesus directly affirms he is the, uh, the, the Messiah, the Christ too. Isn't that amazing? She is the first non-Gentile, sorry, non-Jew or, or Gentile convert. And she becomes, when she goes to call the rest of her town to Jesus and they, and they get saved, she becomes one of the first evangelists in the New Testament. This lady who had so much guilt and shame and it was from a defiled people group. Friends, if Jesus could redeem her story, what can he do for your story? What can he do for your boss's story? What can he do for that person that you just happen to always bump into when you're going and doing your grocery shopping? What about that person that cuts your hair? What about that person that you enjoy a hobby with, whether it's cycling or, or soccer? What about those people you're at every day in college, those hardcore people that you would rather just avoid. If Jesus could see the redemptive story in this lady, can we see the redemptive story in them? Friends, who is in your frame? Not just a natural frame, but a spiritual frame. Who is in your proximity? We've got people here in the arts and entertainment industries who are shining a light for Jesus in an in a industry that desperately needs the light of God to shine where people's identities desperately need to be reformed into who he said they are. Yeah. Are you with me? Yes, yes. You're so kind. The greatest key that, that I think we can take out of all of this is that every person Jesus interacts with, he gives value, dignity, and a kingdom purpose. Here was this lady and he saw value in her. That's why I asked her for a drink. He has this lady who, although she had a checkered past, he gives her dignity because he is willing to engage in a dialogue with her. We, we live in South Africa and we can very quickly develop calloused hearts to those in need because you do get the scam artists, yeah? But what if we started being led by the Holy Spirit? What if we didn't avoid every conversation, but, but we actually started to give people the dignity of dialogue. Friends, there's something just about seeing someone. My, my daughter's learning Isizulu and, and I love the greeting. Saubona literally means, I see you. The response, Sikona, I'm here. Don't you love that our nation, one of our official dialects has such a beautiful way of giving people dignity. I see you, I see you. Friends, when we look at who's in our frame, are we seeing the people God is bringing across our path every single day or are we so caught up in our own worlds that we are missing what He's asking us to see? This isn't meant to be a heavy word, but it is meant to be a challenging word. So three things that we can learn from Jesus. Very easy things. He sees value, He starts a dialogue, and he removes obstacles. Friends, the value that every person carries is not based on what they do, it's based on the fact that they are created in the image of God. Every single person here, every single person listening to my voice, you have been created in the image of God. You're an image bearer of the almighty God and that is where your value comes from. The problem is that we live in a world that is so performance orientated that our value is often derived from what we do. L let me prove this to you. You meet a new person, if you're polite, the first question you'll ask them is, what's your name? Okay? If your parent raised you well, what's your name? Hi, what's your name? What's the second question we normally ask? What do you do? We place more emphasis on human doings than we do on human beings. And that is why when you start sharing the gospel and you start exposing a person's behavior, you're not only exposing their behavior, you're exposing in their minds their what? Their value. Because what they do gives them value. How they do it gives them value. 
What if we started engaging people with absolute love where, where when we engaged them, we started seeing them and giving value to their stories? I was challenged around this a couple of years ago and, and my question, second question, hi, what's your name? Second question is, tell me something of your story. You know how that throws people? Is, 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 sorry, Trevor, come again. No, anything of your story. Pick any part of your story. Tell me something of your story. It's starting to shift the focus of value from what you do to who you are. And it gives us insight into people's lives. Friends, we've we, we got to start realizing that every person in every dialogue has two levels. One is what has been said. The second is what is at stake. What is being said is what's coming out of their mouth. And as you ask questions around that, you start figuring out what is at stake. Jesus realized that this lady, what was at stake in her, in her life, what she was trying to avoid people for was the fact she didn't wanna be rejected again. She didn't wanna be looked down on again. She didn't wanna feel the shame and the guilt of the accusations of the ladies when she came to draw water again. If people are defensive about their faith, the best thing that you can do is say, tell me a bit more about that. You, you, you're struggling with this whole concept of God. Share with me why that is. What, what, what are your beliefs that are, that are holding it there? What you'll generally find is there's some kind of hurt, there's some kind of missed expectation, there's some kind of fear that is at stake. And if they admit to being wrong, it exposes that, that fear, that hurt, that pain. But, but we gotta work up the courage to start challenging people, to start asking them questions. I, I don't know about you, but if you don't know the truth, the more you hear something, the more you think it's truth. I, I remember growing up and, um, and there was a legit time in my life that I believed if you touched a toad, you would get warts. Any, anyone out there, hey, you, you feel me? I believe that bats, bats were blind. Hey, who, who else? Some of you are like, what? Where's this going? <laughs> you, you gotta, next thing you're gonna say, Santa's not real. <laughs> who, who of you have ever heard, don't wear red around a bull in case it charges you? Doesn't like red, people. Or, or if an ostrich gets scared, what happens? Puts his head in a hole. No, no none of that is true. Sorry, it's not. Mark is devastated. He's like, I could have been playing with toads my whole childhood. I've been robbed. But, but toads don't give you warts. Yes, bats use sound to orientate and navigate more, but they're not blind. Like a bull doesn't care if you're waving a red flag or a pink flag or a green flag or yellow. It's just the movement that irritates it. It's gonna charge. And, and an ostrich, doesn't put its hole in the head, uh, sorry, hole in the head. Can we just cut that part out, the, the audio feed? An ostrich doesn't put its head in a hole when it can't run away. If it's, if it's in danger and it can't run away, it falls to the ground and tries to blend in with its environment. Like some of you are devastated right now. Sorry that I had to be the bearer of truth. But, but can you see, it's a silly illustration, but how many of our friends have built up a negative worldview of faith and Christ, not because they know the truth, but because they don't know the truth, but they've heard a lot of people saying a lot of things and so they believe it to be true. Friends, if we can just give people the dignity of dialogue, we will start to expose some of the things in their hearts. I'm gonna ask the, the worship team to come up again, the band. I wanna end off just with this idea of the love of Jesus has the ability to rewrite stories. Friends, the Holy Spirit's leading can unlock the heart 
of the biggest critic if we just listen. If we just listen. We don't need to do this by ourselves. The Holy Spirit can prompt a thought, can prompt a question, can give us the next step in some of the toughest relationships, some family relationships that where we've been praying for years for salvation, friends that we've been contending with for years. One nudging of the Holy Spirit that we are obedient to can unlock the hardest heart. I wanna end off just with, with a story. And the story is uh, of a gentleman by, by the name of Chris Vallotton. And he was interviewing a gentleman by the name of, of Jamie Winship. And Jamie Winship starts his story when he was a young man wanting to be a police officer in the, in the US. So he went to the police academy and, and everything, but he had something different in his heart, a heart. He didn't wanna be a law enforcer. He wanted to be a server and protector, different. And, and so he, he goes through training, starts off as a rookie and he realizes like nothing that we get trained in gives us the skill set to be a server and protector. It only gives us the skill set to be a law enforcer. So he's a Christian and he says, God, like, I need your help. So, so they are not allowed to proselytize or, or preach the gospel as police officers when they're going out. So he says, okay, Lord, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna carry a little notebook around and a pen. And when I get into situations that I don't know what to do, I'm gonna ask you, what would, what would you have me do in this moment? And I'm gonna write it down and I'm gonna do it. And, and an amazing thing happens. God starts to direct him and his partner's path and after five years, they become, or he becomes policeman of the year, he becomes a detective and the, the state department eventually calls him in for an interview because he's solving so many cases that other people couldn't solve. And, and so they wanna interview him in terms of how is he doing this? So, so he agrees to the interview, Jamie agrees. He's like, okay, I'll come. But he's like, you're not gonna like what I, what I say, but I'll come. So they're like, no, come. So they sit him down and they take five years of case files out and they're like, how is it that you're solving all of these crimes? How is it that you're, you're, you're solving all of these cases where other people couldn't? One case, the FBI had been trying for five years and he and his partner solved it, the FBI couldn't solve it. So he says, no, no, I, I remember that case. Um, it, it was to do with a, and he gives a particulars around this, this syndicate that was working, hectic gangs. And he's like, we didn't know what to do. So we prayed and we asked God and he gave us the name of the guy's wife. It just came to us. So we reached out to her, invited her to a McDonald's, led her to Jesus, got her saved and, and just said, we're gonna be praying for you. Jesus appears to her and says, what is happening in the syndicate is hurting your people. You need to take evidence to the police to put your husband away because it's hurting your people. So, so these are the type of stories. He, he gets invited by the State Department to go into terrorist areas and, and he starts bringing peace where there was conflict. But one of the stories that I wanted to leave you with is he gets called by a principal of a primary school. There's this grade eight student who they're about to expel, just like hectic, violent young man, grade eight. And, and, and they're about to expel him, but, but they say, this guy is ticking all of the boxes for being a future child killer, a school shooter. So before we expel him, we just wanna get you in here just to see if you can do something with this young man's life. So he gets into the principal's office with the principal and this young man, this young man's just looking down. They're asking him questions. He's not responding at all. So, so Jamie says, Lord, like help me here. So he feels to go and put his arm around the guy. So, so he says to the young Young boy, do you mind if I come and put my arm around you? And so the young boy says, yes, looking down, not talking. So he whispers into his ear, who are you? And so the young boy just responds, I'm invisible. I'm no one. Friends, there are so many people that we interact with every day that are living under this lie, that they are no one, that they are failure, that they're invisible. So, so Jamie does an incredible thing. And he says, I want you to ask love into, or bring love into this conversation. What does unconditional love have to say to you? This is a kid who doesn't know Jesus. 
doesn't know anything. And he waits for a moment and he says, love says music theory, music theory. So Jamie's like, do, do, do you like play music? Do you have a musical instrument? The young boy's like, no. So, so he was living with his, his granddad, really broken story. Granddad like would ignore him, didn't want anything to do with him because he was so messed up. And so Jamie says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy this kid a guitar if you can organize music lessons for him. So they do that. He comes back a year later to that school. This young boy is now in grade nine. Great student, doing exceptionally well at music. Everything changed, why? Because Jamie was willing to put this young boy in his frame and encourage him to hear what is love saying. Friends, what is love saying in your life? I don't know your story. I don't know where you act with Jesus. I don't know where your, where your life is. I don't know what struggles you're under, but Jesus knows. And He wants to speak into your situation. What does love say? There are people in your family that you're contending for and, and you've built up such a, such a negativity to how they interact with you around the faith. But if you had to ask the Lord, like what does love say about them? What would His response be? Can I ask us to do something now? I wanna ask you just to, to close your eyes and when it comes to this idea of reaching out to people that don't know Jesus, I believe love, the Holy Spirit, wants to give you just one idea, one idea. Can you do that now? Just take a moment. What does love have to say about who we're reaching? What does love have to say about who's in our frame? Just one idea, Lord, one truth, one name, one face, one opportunity to express your love to someone in dire need. spoken to you, that, that's wonderful. If He's given you a nudge or prompting or an image or a name, that's wonderful. But if He hasn't, I, I wanna ask you to take this out of this meeting and continue the question, what does love say? Just, just give me one thing, Lord, when it comes to reaching out to other people. And then I, I felt we, we can't have a message like this with, without a call to action. So uh, in my hand, I've got, this is a 30 day devotional and apologetics playbook that we wrote for our college students, that they've started going through this year. All of our teaching staff have gone through it. And, and it's, a, it's a reason for faith and hope. But on day 27 of 30, there's, a, there's a, a devotion on how we reach out to people to share the gospel. And if you're in a connect group, after the meeting, your connect group leader is gonna send you an extract of this workbook, day 27. And I'm gonna ask you to, to work through that. If you're not in a connect group, you can go to our, our website and you can download it or you can message reception at nccb.org.za and you can ask for the extract. But, but I'm gonna ask friends, we can't be stirred with truth and not see a change in behavior. Is that okay? So if I can ask you in this next week, go through that devotion and, and ask the Holy Spirit, what does love say? in terms of who's in my frame. Can I ask everyone to, to stand with me? Kenda and the team are gonna lead us in another song, but, but I'd love to pray for you before we do that. Who, who over here, you, you feel you, you wanna make right with Jesus. You, you haven't been living in a way that's been honoring Him. Perhaps you don't even know Him, but today, you say, I, I, wanna, I wanna more readily hear what love is saying over my life. Is there anyone like that this morning? Would you mind just putting your hand up so I can see you? Anyone like that? Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone else? I, I, I wanna pray with you, sir. If you wouldn't mind right now, 
could we just close our eyes and, and just pray in your heart, pray out loud, whatever you want. Just say, Lord Jesus, this morning I repent for choosing my own way. This morning I ask that you would come into my life as my Saviour and Lord. I choose to turn away from my old life and I choose to follow you, Lord Jesus. I thank you that as of today, my sin is removed as far as the East is from the West and I made a new creation in you, amen. Lord Jesus, for everyone else, I pray that this would be a moment that would not just be fleeting, but that your truth would be established in our hearts and that we would go out asking you the question, how can your love be made complete in the lives of the people that we interact with? In Jesus' name, amen. Just you gaze on your
Father, we've been charged this morning, stirred, encouraged. Often these engagements with people, God, have eternal ramifications. And Father, what you're calling us to, even as Trevor just encouraged us this morning is, is something far greater than just having a great conversation. It's calling people, Lord God, to a place where they acknowledge you, Father God, for the sake of eternity. Remind us again, God, of the fact that, Lord, even here on this planet, that, that as you reference life to be like a mist, it's here for a short while and then it's gone, just like that. And so I just pray, God, that there'd be a weightiness of the message this morning that would really stir our hearts, our lives into action, Lord God, for the sake of seeing people, Lord God, the way that you see them. And if people matter to you, God, they should matter to us. And so, Father, even this morning, we surrender ourselves again to the greatest call that any human being could ever be given to go and make disciples of all nations. We, your disciples, we, your people, sent ones out of our front doors into the highways and the byways of the city of Johannesburg, Lord God, and to the nations of the world. Father, we respond this morning under your leading. your leading. You are our treasure, our great delight. In Jesus' name, the name above all names. about you, but do you sense the presence of God just in this place? Is a commission that, that comes whenever the Word of God is preached. It's a commission, not just to paid professionals, not to those who have degrees, but it's a commission to God's people to be awakened again to the urgency of the hour. The urgency of the hour to respond to something of what Trev has just encouraged us to do. So we do that this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's be seated. Can we just thank Trev? So wonderful. I noticed my picture's not up here. So I've got a long way to go. Hey Trev, it's on the other wall. The one outside the back by the dustbins is where it is. If you missed the men's event yesterday, you missed a good thing. Yeah, I beat Trev up. Actually, no, he beat me up. So anyway, it's a good, uh, if you missed it, I'm sure on social media there will be something, but thanks to Albert and the team. It was an outstanding morning. Uh, so if you didn't come and you want to come to the next one, just look out, there will be more. But us men, this is a great time for us to connect in. Let me get through what we need to get through because we've got exciting stuff to happen outside. Um, offering, if you've come prepared to give financially, if you get physical cash, we have boxes on either side of the stage. You can come straight after the service. Um, but we've got SnapScan behind me as well as banking details for those of us who do transfers or SnapScan. Words of knowledge, and, and I just, it's been amazing because throughout this morning, there's just been this weightiness around God dealing with fear. And I know the team who have been praying for us this morning are prepared and ready, and they really do want everyone who is wrestling around this area of fear, 
to be prayed for this morning. But there are a few that uh, standouts that we'd like to just highlight. So if you have pain in your right knee, and I assume it's pain in your left hip because it just says left hip. I've also got a left hip, but if it's got pain here, that's why I'm responding. Right arm and elbow, if there's pain there, pancreas problems as well. We'd love to pray for you straight after the service. If your name is Des, a man, a man named Des, or if your name is Sarah, we'd love to pray with you. And the Holy Spirit wants to open physical and spiritual ears. And so if you're struggling just to hear God, or if physically you cannot hear, we'd love to pray for you afterwards. In your business, maybe you're a business person, and if you're struggling and needing encouragement, we'd love to encourage you this morning, so won't you come up? And if you are struggling with disunity in your relationships, uh, maybe it's a personal one, or just in friendships or your marriage, we'd love to pray for you. And then these are the three areas that, that just really, from a fear point of view, we're wanting to pray. Anxiety around provision, future, Maybe it's your health or finances, fear of the dark, dark spaces, or in the sense of just your lack of vision and understanding of what lies beyond, or fear of illness and death. Wow, these are quite specific. And so we'd love to pray with you straight after the service. Up front, we have a team that would love to minister with you, with you. I'd love for us to look at the screens and uh, we are gonna play a little video just around invitational culture. So won't you enjoy, go for it. Oh. My sister invited me to NCCB in 2016. I started attending here in 2017 when I applied for the internship. So in 2017, I was the kids ministry intern. I got a lot of experience with kids. I didn't know that's where the Lord actually wanted me to have me where he has me now because it literally aided me to being the teacher that I am today at Little Flock, which is right here on campus. And the leadership and just everyone who mentored me really pushed me, it took me out of my comfort zone in a good way where I could hold confidence and talk in front of lots of people and just be myself. Um, a highlight for me would be serving in kids ministry and in the worship team. I learned a lot from um, the people around me and I've made a lot of close friends as well. I think it's just a great place for community, first of all. When you're going through something good and something bad, you always need community. The church has been a place where I've learned about myself and learned how to interact with others and also obviously learning more about God and who He is. It's a guidance for me every single day and I still have people around me who guide me and always ask how, how I'm doing and genuinely want to know how I'm doing and always want the best for me. Even the leadership always reaching out, which has been incredible for me. Thank you, Kendra, for sharing your story. Who enjoyed worship this morning? It was a powerful time. Well done, Kendra. So if Kendra was not invited to this body, to this church, she wouldn't have ever been here ministering. Invitation is a, is a powerful thing. And so we would love to just encourage us over this next bit that we are a church that invites friends and family. We want to stir our hearts to be a church that is invitational in every area. And so there's a few things I'd love for you to encourage your friends to. Firstly, corporate prayer, which is happening on the 2nd of August. That's this Tuesday evening. If you've never come to a corporate prayer, we'd love to encourage you to come, bring some food, share it with some friends. This place gets transformed with tables and chairs around pretty much this whole floor. And uh, we get to eat together and we get to pray and worship together. So that's 6.30 this Tuesday. Connect groups are aware of it, but those who are not connected in connect groups, please come out. There's always space and we'd love to meet with you and connect you with, into community. Next one is uh, next Sunday evening is another first worship uh, time of worship. Woo -woo! There we go. So if you've never come to a time of worship, uh, won't you come out six o'clock on Sunday, the 7th of August. I was gonna say October, but there it is. We have chips available, slub chips at 25 bucks and some bingo afterwards. Some prizes to be won. 
Uh, so if you love bingo and that makes you excited and pumped and your competitive spirit starts to manifest, then please come out. It's going to be a great time. Obviously, we had a worship first, okay? Then we'd play bingo later. All right. And then straight after the service, out on the bottom field, we have summer in July, our last one. And uh, we have uh, Fed Cook, not Fed Cook Palace, but Fed Cook on sale. Uh, we haven't created a Fed Cook Palace for those of us who remember Fed Cook Palace, but 35 bucks gets you a Fed Cook, uh, 50 bucks Fed Cook and a drink. Um, and then there's a cool dance party for all the kids and for those older folk who love to join in in front of the welcome sign also at the bottom there. So when you fetch your kids after the service up at Kids Ministry, please make your way down. They're really gonna have a fun time having um, a dance section there. As well as on the bottom field, we've got netball happening, action netball. I don't know if netball can be action, but yes, action netball. Excuse me, I, I'm ignorant. But anyway, I'm just saying what I feel right now. And then also we've got some, um, I was going to say darts, but it's not quite darts. It's arrow tag. That's exactly what it is. Arrow tag, there, there you go. We'll see that all set up down at the bottom. Don't worry, people. There's no pointy bits at the end to go into people's eyes. It's uh, quite a safe, exciting, like uh, arrow, sort of hunt your friend down and kill him type of experience. All right. So it's going to be fun. Please don't go out straight away to the parking lot. You have to go out the building and to the left. That's exactly where we need you. And if you are visiting, we're a friendly bunch. <laughs> we're a friendly bunch, and we'd love to meet you. So if this is your first time, we've got some nice eats in the foyer. On your way out on the left, a great team that'd love to welcome you and connect with you. All right, I think I've had enough to say. Have a great Sunday, guys. Enjoy. Thank you so much. There is a sound to this canvas. If God be for you, who can be against you? Thanks, dear. 